It's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode 50, and today we are talking about some history of breakfast. Ask Adam. I'm Zachary, I'm from France, and I was wondering why you guys eat eggs in the morning on top of pretty much everything. I, I from my French uh, point of view, it seems that anything, any food, savory food, can be topped with an egg and be called a breakfast item. And we do not have that in France. Zachary, I'm going to call you Zach, because there's uh, no way I could do justice to the lovely French pronunciation of your full name. Obviously, Zach, Zach knows that the French also eat eggs for breakfast. It's not just us Americans. What Zach is referring to is the tendency of Americans to slap a greasy fried egg on anything and call it a breakfast item, which is a real thing, though I have no idea if it is really a particular thing to the United States. The U.S. gets blamed for all kinds of things that the rest of the world also does, but we're just more visible about it because... Our popular culture, our media is a big part of the entire world's media. So everybody sees what we do, or at least everyone sees what we do filtered through the lens of our media, which, as anyone knows, is not a fully authentic depiction of reality. A lot of us really do eat at Burger King, and a lot of us really do eat those BK breakfast sandwiches, but a Burger King commercial is not a great view into the real mundane American life. And of course, Australians, uh, by Burger King, I mean Hungry Jacks. Because when Burger King expanded down under in the 1970s, they apparently found that there was a tiny place in Adelaide that was already called Burger King, and that place owned the trademark, so Hungry Jacks. Jack Cowan was the original Australian Burger King franchisee, and one presumes he was hungry for burgers or money. It's all the same. Anyway, Lauren and I were just talking the other day about how I need to do a breakfast pizza recipe on YouTube because I haven't yet. And let's be honest, what will make it a breakfast pizza? I will crack an egg on it. That will make it a breakfast pizza. Does that mean any food with an egg on it is breakfast? Absolutely not. Eggs are ubiquitous in Western cuisine. It is merely the case that most of the eggs we eat outside of breakfast are hidden. You eat hidden eggs inside cakes and two-thirds of all other baked goods that you could think of. Egg proteins provide a structural matrix that holds cake together. It's one of the things that makes cake different from bread. The structural matrix of bread is mostly wheat protein and wheat starch, the proteins being chiefly the, uh, the gluten proteins of glutenin and gliadin. That's more than enough structure to hold a loaf of bread together and to retain steam and other gases inside the oven, thus puffing up the loaf. One of the challenges of gluten-free baking is that breads just tend to bake up flat and dense. Cake has proportionally less flour than bread. The flour we use for cake has proportionally less protein. And in the place of flour, we have ingredients like sugar and fat that weaken the structural matrix of wheat doughs. And so... Instead, we use egg proteins to hold cakes together and to make them rise in the oven. And as a bonus, we get all the emulsifiers in the egg yolk that allow the cake to hold a ton of fat inside it without a bunch of, like, free grease flowing inside the crumb. Baked goods are filled with hidden eggs. Sauces are filled with hidden eggs, especially the ones we got from you, Zach. And, of course, by you, I mean the French. God, I love a good hollandaise sauce. Hollandaise is basically mayonnaise made with butter instead of oil. In both cases, the sauce is emulsified with egg yolk. I also love eggs, especially a poached egg. And I love English muffins. So you would think that I would love Eggs Benedict, a classic upscale breakfast dish traditionally attributed to Delmonico's restaurant in New York. Lots of things get attributed to Delmonico's that probably shouldn't. It's like all the ancient inventions that get attributed to whatever king or emperor was in charge at the time. Kings and emperors did actually invent things, but probably not as many as history records. 
Eggs Benedict is a stacked dish, the foundation layer being half of a toasted English muffin cut side up. Oh, and by English muffin, of course, Brits, I mean a small, chewy crumpet. Toasted English muffin, half on the bottom. Stacked on top, you usually have a slice of Canadian bacon, if you're into that, aka back bacon. Whereas normal bacon is made from the extremely fatty and inexpensive pork belly, Canadian bacon is made from the extremely lean and expensive tender pork loin, the prime cut of pork. Seems like an odd choice to preserve the loin into bacon instead of just eating it fresh. That'd be like making a, like beef brizola out of ribeye or something. No idea how Canadian bacon happened, but I guess the reason that ended up on Eggs Benedict is just that Canadian bacon slices are round, so they fit perfectly on top of a nice round English muffin half. Muffin, bacon... The poached egg goes on next, and then on top, you pour the hollandaise sauce. I love every component of this dish individually. The reason I don't like them together is that the egg and the hollandaise are redundant. Any dish that involves a runny egg already has sauce. The hot liquid egg yolk is the sauce. That's the whole point of cooking a runny egg. You break into the yolk and this delicious yellow sauce spills out. When you cut into an Eggs Benedict, the yolk spills out and it is simply incorporated into the hollandaise, which is also yellow and also contains egg yolk. It always reminds me of that historical description of the death of Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, murdered in his cathedral in 1170 after King Henry II said, will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? Or maybe he didn't actually say that, but four of his knights definitely did ride to Canterbury and murder Becket. And this is going to get gruesome if you want to skip ahead a minute. The knights landed several sword blows on Becket and one sliced off the top of his skull and his gray matter spilled out onto the cathedral floor. The monk Edward Grimm later described the white of the brain mixing with the red of the blood in a curiously beautiful swirl on the floor there. I think of that whenever I first cut through my eggs Benedict and spill out the egg yolk because instead of white mingling with red or some other pretty color combination, you just get yellow mingling with yellow. And I think, what is even the point? The result is just extra yellow, extra eggy sauce, often too much sauce. It gets the English muffin all soggy. I think Eggs Benedict should have no hollandaise. You have the poached egg, so you already have the sauce. All you need is just to serve it with some lemon to squeeze over the top to to cut the richness with some acid, which is why you have lemon juice or vinegar in the hollandaise. Anyway, let's talk about why eggs are particularly associated with breakfast in the U.S. and in other cultures. The big reason is the one that Zach already knows, and you probably already know, which is that eggs are something that you have when you first wake up in the morning. In the traditional agrarian life from which many, most, traditions descend, there are two jobs that have to be done as soon as you wake up on the family farm. Job one is milk the cows. Cows have to be milked twice a day. That means 12 hours apart, ideally. If you wait until 11 o'clock in the morning to milk the cows, that means you're going to need to milk them again at 11 o'clock at night. And that doesn't work. The cows may be asleep by 11 o'clock at night, and you almost certainly will be asleep by 11 because you're a pre-modern subsistence farmer and your entire life revolves around the daily and seasonal cycles of the sun. Artificial light is scarce, so you wake up with the sun. You do back-breaking work all day, and then when it gets too dark to work anymore, you go to sleep. That will probably be well before 11 at night. So, 
in order to space out those two daily milkings as evenly as possible, you want to milk the cows as early in the morning as you can so that you can milk them as early in the evening as you can. You milk them at 5 a.m. so that you can milk them again at 5 p.m. And you'll have light for both sessions in the warmer months, at least. If you let a dairy cow go more than 12 hours without milking her, she's going to be in pain. Anyone who's ever been or who has ever been around a breastfeeding mother knows this. As mammary glands produce milk, pressure builds up inside the line that must be released or else. And even if you don't care about your dairy cow's well-being, you do care about milk yield, and yield will plummet if you don't milk your cows every 12 hours, because unhappy cows don't make much milk, and if you don't milk them, that signals the mammary glands to make less milk, which is what they're evolved to do as the calves are gradually weaned off of milk and onto grass, etc. So... The first thing you do when you wake up on the farm is you milk the cows, and therefore you have the freshest milk in the world on hand first thing in the morning. It's nature's ultimate energy drink, all the macronutrients you could need, and the micronutrients too. You've got a day of grueling physical labor ahead of you, so you drink the milk for breakfast, assuming that you are among the minority of the world's humans who are able to metabolize lactose into adulthood. We talked about lactose intolerance in a previous pod. The ability to digest milk, milk sugar specifically, the ability to digest that milk sugar beyond childhood evolved separately in several pockets of the Earth's population. But one of them was Northern Europe, where a random genetic mutation that allowed you to digest lactose as an adult would have been particularly advantageous. Northern Europe is cold and dark. Grass is a hardy plant that can grow almost anywhere, but people can't digest it, so we bred cows that convert grass into milk for us. Also, people need vitamin D, which is generally synthesized in their skin in response to light. Milk is a great source of digestible vitamin D for people who don't get a lot of sun, like Northern Europeans. And so anybody in Northern Europe who happened to have the weird gene that allowed their body to make lactase enzyme into adulthood, they would have had an advantage over other people and their children would have been more likely to survive and pass the mutation on to their children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Scientists believe this to be one of the most prominent examples of recent human evolution. And it happened about 10,000 years ago with the birth of agrarian civilization and the domestication of animals uh, beyond just dogs, which we already had. Like all evolution, it was probably mostly just random chance, not a trait that humans consciously cultivated among themselves. This is something that I've been meaning to say to uh, Ethan Krellenston. Ethan Krellenston is a famous and apparently very successful grappler in various combat sports. And he also apparently listens to the Adam Ragusea pod. I know this because Ethan has his own pod with a couple other successful jujitsu dudes. And they were talking about lactose intolerance on a recent episode. And Ethan mentioned my lactose episode. Thank you to listener uh, Will Gray, who flagged that for me. Ethan, you're a badass. Quite happy to have you in my little community, but I do want to clarify something. You listened to my lactose episode and you apparently came away with the impression that people like deliberately cultivated a lifetime ability to digest lactose by simply continuing to drink animal milk into adulthood. And that's probably not what happened. You can't keep yourself lactose tolerant by continuing to drink milk into adulthood. The gene to make lactase enzyme into adulthood is just something that some humans evolved and you either have it or you don't. And evolution is non-teleological, meaning it shows no evidence of intelligent design or conscious purpose of any kind. Genes just mutate randomly, weirdly, and most mutations don't affect the survivability of the organism at all, but some of them do. 
And if the mutation happens to help the organism to survive and to thrive, well, then the organism will probably reproduce and communities of that organism with this new mutation will be able to outcompete neighboring communities that don't have the mutation, et cetera, et cetera. There is zero evidence that you can stop yourself from becoming lactose intolerant in adulthood. Either you have the genes to keep producing lactase or you don't. Or maybe you have both and your body just randomly shifts between phases of being able to digest lactose the way that mine irritatingly does. Glad we cleared that up. Or should I say, I'm glad that we grappled with that, Ethan. (laughs) Hissing retainer laugh. Anyway, Zach is from France. And a majority of people in France can digest lactose just fine. Same deal in the United States, given how much of our DNA came from Northern Europe. And milk is a very popular breakfast item in both places because milk is extremely nutritious and you have a jug of it first thing in the morning because you woke up and the first thing you did was milk the cows. The other first thing that you did upon waking on your little family farm is that you stumbled blurrily into the chicken coop and you collected any eggs the hens may have laid since you last checked. Why do chickens lay eggs? I mean, obviously they do it for reproduction, but why do they lay eggs? unfertilized eggs at regular and frequent intervals for us to eat. That seems like an enormous waste of energy from the bird's perspective. Birds in the wild generally do not lay unfertilized eggs. They mate, so each egg gets a little embryo inside it. And when a snake or something eats an egg in the wild, the snake is not only enjoying the delicious egg white and egg yolk, but also the delicious baby bird inside. People generally aren't into that. With some notable exceptions like um, balut, the traditional street food of the Philippines, now popular uh, throughout Southeast Asia, I believe, and it consists of a, a fertilized duck egg incubated for two or three weeks until the embryo is big and meaty, but it doesn't have any super crunchy bones or feathers yet. And then you steam the egg whole and you slurp its contents directly from the shell. Balut. No shame if you're into that, but most people listening to this probably aren't into that. Instead of a steamed chicken embryo, Hey, how about some nuggets? How about free chicken nuggets for a year, courtesy of ButcherBox, sponsor of this episode? Just go to butcherbox.com slash ragusia. High quality, ethically produced meat and seafood does not have to be super expensive. ButcherBox sources 100% grass-fed beef, free-range organic chicken, pork raised crate-free, and wild-caught seafood. They get it humanely raised with no antibiotics or added hormones, and then they ship it right to your door. Free shipping, always. You tell them what you like, you know, what sort of things you like to eat, and they assemble curated, customized boxes filled with whatever they can get at the best price and, and the best freshness. I get up, I got a box recently, and everything came just perfectly frozen rock solid. It was on dry ice, vacuum packed, no loss of quality at all. Everything that I couldn't eat right away, I just threw directly in the freezer. The beef roast and the chicken that I wanted to cook, I thawed in the fridge overnight and bam, amazing. And then last night I got a hankering for a steak because Lauren was out of town and I usually make a steak when she's gone. Butcher Box sent me these gorgeous grass-fed ribeyes with this really fragrant yellow fat that's typical of cattle that are not finished on grain the way that you know mainstream cattle are. So I speed thawed that baby in a little bowl of water. I grilled it up. I gave the uh, intermuscular fat to the dog. So glad I have a dog again so I can do that. It was just the best. And when you sign up for ButcherBox deliveries today with my link and code, you will get 10% off your first box and free chicken nuggets for a year. ButcherBox has their own chicken nugget brand. It's a a 22-ounce bag, gluten-free, extremely delicious. Do them in the air fryer if you have one. And of course, by that, I mean a tabletop convection oven. You get one bag of nuggets free with every ButcherBox order for a year when you sign up at ButcherBox.com slash Ragusea and you use my code Ragusea at checkout. 
All of that is in the description, butcherbox.com slash ragusea. Thank you, butcherbox. Anyway, yeah, most people prefer to eat unfertilized eggs with no baby bird inside. They just want to eat the growing medium for the baby bird, the white. And maybe they want to eat the food source for the baby bird too, the yolk. The egg, like milk, is a food that animals make to feed their young. We humans simply hijack it for our own need. Why do chickens go along with this? Why would they lay eggs even when they haven't made it? Isn't it a catastrophic waste of energy to lay an infertile egg? Well, just like humans, birds start their lives with all of the oocytes or egg cells that they're ever going to have. And in the springtime, when every bird's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love, a hen's ovaries will enlarge. And to sustain this, she'll have to eat extra food, particularly nitrogenous food, protein from you know, worms or bugs or legumes growing in the ground. The oocyte matures into a little ovum, which is an immature, unfertilized egg. The ovum passes into the infundibulum, a funnel-like structure that catches the male contributions to conception, and it funnels those contributions into the ovum. And once fertilized, the ovum is an egg. It grows, it passes down into the oviduct, the last step is that it develops a hard shell out of uh, calcium compounds. Finally, the egg passes into the cloaca, which is the opening through which birds pass both their young and their food waste. Birds have only one hole at the end of the line, whereas we have two. And there's your fertilized egg ready to be incubated by mom for a few weeks until it hatches. If there's no male around who is willing and able to do what comes natural, the ovum never becomes an egg. Instead, it basically liquefies inside the bird and its nutrients are reabsorbed by the bird, which is the efficient thing to do. That's what makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. Don't waste your energy developing eggs that will never hatch. Sometimes weird things happen, weird hormonal blips or whatever, and birds in the wild will lay unfertilized eggs, but it's not common. No one knows exactly how uncommon it is in the wild, simply because there is usually a willing and able male around in the wild. But we know what wild birds do in captivity. Think about exotic birds that people keep in cages as pets. Every now and then, your female cockatoo or whatever will lay an egg in the cage, even though there are definitely no male cockatoos in there with her. Laying an unfertilized egg is, in essence, a biological mistake on the part of the bird, and the conditions of captivity seem to be conducive to making this particular mistake. Overexposure to light seems to lead to infertile egg laying. That's one reason you're supposed to cover your bird's cage with a blanket or something at night. We tend to feed our pet birds very generously, and that alone can signal their bodies to make eggs because it's basically constant springtime in their world. Giving them cardboard to shred. Birds love that, but it triggers all of their egg-laying hormonal processes because nesting. The reason that they like to shred the cardboard is because they can make nest material out of it. Nests are for eggs. And now I've read that uh, exotic bird people also warn each other against um, petting their birds a little too intensely. Parrots and such can be very cuddly, and you're only supposed to pet them on their head and their neck. If you pet them down on their belly or whatever, you're basically doing what the male bird would do, and you are catalyzing hormonal processes that lead to egg laying. If your bird lays one infertile egg every year or two, that's just fine. But if she lays lots of eggs, she can get exhausted from that. She's literally pouring herself into these wasted eggs. And she might know on some level that the eggs are infertile. She'll lose interest in incubating them, and she might even eat them to reclaim some of the nutrients. But exotic birds in cages that lay tons of eggs can end up getting sick and weak, and you have to take your bird to the vet to get hormones hormone injections to stop them from laying eggs. And yes, that's a real thing that exotic bird people do. 
No shame to exotic bird people. Birds are cool. Some of them are extremely smart. Not so much chickens. All of this is in marked contrast with a modern domestic commercial egg-laying hen, which produces nearly 300 infertile eggs a year. Why do they do this? Well, evolution might be non-teleological, but domestication is teleological AF. We definitely have a plan and intelligent design when we breed animals to be more useful to us. The domestication of the chicken happened in Southeast Asia. There's evidence of it happening as far back as like 8,000 years ago, but the latest research indicates it didn't really get going until about three or 4,000 years ago, perhaps in response to the advent of rice farming, rice and uh, millet. Chickens are domesticated jungle fowl. Jungle fowl are a few species of galliforms, and galliforms are big, meaty birds like turkeys that that don't swim or fly too good. They evolved to live mostly on the ground where they forage for food rather than hunting for food. They're too big and meaty and slow to be good hunters, unless their prey is like a worm. Chickens started off as jungle fowl. If there's a community of weird, hairless apes nearby, and they are growing and harvesting and threshing and cooking rice, then there's going to be lots of little stray rice grains on the ground all around the little village where these weird, hairless apes live. And so if you're a jungle fowl, you're going to be attracted to human communities. You and your jungle fowl buddies are going to start hanging around the camps where the hairless monkeys live so that you can eat the grains of rice that they drop on the ground. The hairless monkeys don't mind. There's no way they can gather up every single grain of rice that they farm. And hey, If a hairless monkey ever gets really hungry and decides to eat one of your jungle fowl buddies, well, nobody ever liked Carl anyway, and there's more rice than there is chicken-eating hairless monkeys, and so it remains in your net interest to hang around the hairless monkey camp. Fast forward a few thousand generations, and the jungle fowl that hang out near the humans have changed. They've gotten maybe a little softer. Their life is particularly easy with humans just dropping this incredibly nutrient-dense food on the ground all day. So the birds get bigger and fatter and slower and maybe dumber, but also more like docile so that they can live in harmony with each other and with the humans in these dense colonies. This is basically how the domestication of the dog started some 100,000 years earlier. Dogs started off as wolves who hung around human encampments to eat our scraps and our trash. We were less likely to kill or drive off the docile wolves. In fact, we kind of liked the relatively docile wolves. Maybe we'd throw our favorite one an extra mammoth bone from time to time, and thus the wolves that were more peaceful and sociable by nature were able to outbreed the other ones. And for humans, it was super useful to have wolves living on the periphery of our camps. They were like a security system. They'd bark and make a racket if any strangers came by, and so dogs. First, you kind of unintentionally favor the less terrifyingly violent wolves, and that influences their evolution. And then eventually you start breeding wolves to isolate traits that are desirable to you, and you get all the different breeds of dogs we have today. People in Southeast Asia eventually started breeding the jungle fowl that hung out around their villages. You'd notice that this hen and this rooster are both particularly big and meaty and delicious looking, so you get those two crazy kids together, and they're offspring are all particularly big and meaty. Or you notice that this one hen keeps laying tons of eggs with or without embryos inside them. Maybe she's got like a weird random genetic mutation that affects her endocrine system and her body makes tons of the hormones that lead to egg laying. And this behavior will probably get her killed in the wild, right? Like she could never eat enough to sustain all of this egg laying in the wild. And so she'd eventually get sick and she'd die. But your village with all the rice grains laying around the threshing floor, this is a rich enough environment for such a mutated egg laying hen to survive and thrive. She can sustain all of her weird extra egg laying and maybe you notice it and you like eggs. So you figure, hey, let's breed this hen. Let's get her together with this 
big, strong rooster that we like, and let's make an effort to not eat her fertilized eggs. Let's let them grow up into hens that will hopefully also lay a totally illogical number of eggs. And maybe you do this with the intention of simply getting more chickens that you, than you would get otherwise, but eventually the mutations that lead to infertile egg laying are able to express themselves and multiply within this unnatural context you've created through your selective breeding, and yeah, domesticated egg-laying hens. The earliest anatomically modern domestic chicken bone was found in the Neolithic Bon Non Wat site in central Thailand, and it's from about 1400 BCE. We bred jungle fowl to have a number of weird traits that they wouldn't have evolved in the wild, and one of those traits is to lay lots of unfertilized eggs. A modern backyard domestic hen will lay about an egg a day during the warmer months of her peak egg-laying years, which usually are no more than two years. Uh, they can go longer, but they start laying fewer and fewer eggs, and eventually the hen gets way more useful as a uh, soup. It was funny. I did, a, I did a YouTube video a few months ago about how to make soup from a whole chicken. And people in the comments said, hey, why didn't you use a stewing hen? A stewing hen is an egg-laying hen who has gotten to be two or three years old and she isn't producing many eggs, so uh, chop. The meat is tough and stringy and a little gamey compared to your typical grocery store meat chicken or uh, like a broiler fryer, which is generally only two months old at the most when it's slaughtered. So it's you know, young and tender. The stewing hen is old and tough, which is bad for lots of dishes, but it's great for soups and stews where you can gradually dissolve all of that collagen into delicious gelatin. And I would have loved to have used a stewing hen for my chicken soup, but you do not see those in U.S. grocery stores anymore. You did when I was younger. I remember going out to the store sometime in my 20s and getting a stewing hen because Alton Brown told me to. The hen was frozen, as less common meats generally are these days, but it was available in the like frozen meat case at my normal grocery store. Nowadays, you almost never see a stewing hen for sale in a mainstream U.S. supermarket. Certainly, you can order them online. Uh, and you can get them directly from, you know, small specialty farms and such, but they're not at the Kroger or whatever. And the reason is pretty gruesome. So skip ahead a couple of minutes if you don't want to hear about some animal cruelty shit. In the U.S., laying hens these days tend to be... Uh, totally distinct breeding lines, like developed expressly for egg production. They never taste terribly good or produce a ton of meat. And big mainstream producers generally get even more eggs out of these hens with a technique called induced molting or forced molting. When the hens start to make fewer eggs, you starve them and you perhaps even deprive them of water for a few days. And this causes the birds to molt or to shed feathers as they would naturally once or twice a year in response to seasonal conditions. And after they molt, you resume feeding them and this has the effect of resetting their whole system as though it's a new year, a new season, and they will resume egg production. And by the time they stumble to the finish line of their lives, the hens are ragged and spent and not desirable for any human consumers. So they generally just end up as animal feed or pet food, at least in the United States. Forced molting is banned in the European Union. And certainly, not all egg producers in the U.S. use forced molting. I pay extra for humanely raised eggs. I make no judgments about what you do with the resources that are available to you. I will say I think you're a lot more important than a chicken. I've also read that some of our other more mature chicken meat products in the United States tend to go to foreign markets these days, uh, most notably Mexico and China two places where people really appreciate a good stewing hen. So that's why there's no stewing hens anymore at uh, the Publix or whatever. Where were we? Eggs, right. 
It's generally considered best practice to retrieve the eggs from the chicken coop as soon as possible, like right after they have been laid. Because once an egg is laid, it's likely to get dirty, stepped on, damaged. In the summer, conditions are perfect for bacterial growth. It could even get so hot that the egg could cook a little. So you're supposed to collect your eggs as soon as possible. And on the farm, that generally means going out to the coop to check for eggs twice a day, the same way that you would do with milking the cows. You check for eggs in the morning and again before bed. Either way, you're going to have some eggs handy first thing in the morning when you wake up, either eggs that were laid that morning or the eggs that you collected last night before bed. And either way, the eggs are just sitting there waiting to be eaten first thing in the morning, along with the milk that you just milked. It's not an accident that those two items are combined in so many classic breakfast foods. Egg plus milk or cream equals custard. You wake up, you take your stale hard bread from yesterday, you soak it in eggs and milk until soft, and then you fry it in a pan with butter, and that's French toast, or pan perdu, as Zach would say. Pan means bread in French, and perdu means lost, lost bread, wasted stale bread reclaimed from the garbage heap by soaking it in custard. Another reason eggs are great for breakfast is how quick they are to cook. One of the things that makes breakfast fundamentally different from all other meals is that you don't have all day to cook it. Breakfast is the only meal that by its very nature must be an instant meal, or it must be prepared for you by someone who stayed up all night to cook for you while you slept, i.e. a baker or a servant, etc. This raises the issue of class, and class is particularly relevant to breakfast. There are examples of socioeconomically hierarchical societies where breakfast is something that rich people kind of look down on. In medieval Europe, for example, Upper-class adults generally ate only two meals per day. Among the rich, a meal first thing in the morning was something reserved for growing children who wake up super hungry and are totally unable to focus on anything until you feed them. That dynamic is still with us today, right? Like lots of us adults either skip breakfast or we eat a really pathetic kind of half breakfast, but we still try really hard to give our kids a complete breakfast before they go to school. And schools often provide breakfast to kids whose parents can't, can't get it to them, etc. A medieval European aristocrat would have viewed breakfast as something for children or for peasants. Only those dirty peasants need to fill up on something before they embark on yet another day of ceaseless toil. Indeed, breakfast is particularly crucial for agricultural laborers because farm fields are very big, especially when you're not just farming your pathetic little subsistence plot, but when you're working on the, uh, how's it pronounced? Uh, it looks like demence in French, but it's pronounced, I think, demain, domain. That's the very big farm that's managed directly by the lord of the manor for his own enrichment. You're obligated to work on that when you're a peasant. You can't go out to work on one of these fields and then just jog back inside for a snack whenever you get hungry. You might have to walk some distance to get to the the particular field that you're supposed to work that day. So you got to eat something really substantial before you leave the house. And eggs would have been a great choice. They're produced essentially for free by the chickens that run around your pathetic little hovel. You can cook the egg by simply dropping it whole in the shell into the glowing embers of your pathetic little fire from last night. They cook in minutes and each egg is packed with fats for energy and proteins for maintenance of your body's tissues and or for energy. Protein and fats are the slower digesting macronutrients. They provide you with time release energy for your work. Meat does the same thing for you, but meat is more expensive. Eggs would have been a frugal source of time-release energy for peasants. Most of us listening to this program have probably been continuously well-fed enough and underworked enough so that we literally don't know what it feels like to be out of gas. But people working in the fields in ye olden days 
definitely knew what that felt like. They knew that food equals work. The lord of the manor would probably eat his main meal in the middle of the day, around noon. At that point, there's been time to bake bread and do all the other time-consuming cooking tasks. And you've got your appetite back by noon, right? Because most adults see their hunger hormones plummet in the middle of the night and then remain very low through the morning. By lunchtime, you're back in business, hormonally speaking. So you'd eat a big meal in the middle of the day called dinner in English, and then you'd eat a smaller meal in the evening called supper. A big evening meal was something associated with partying and drinking and gambling deep into the night and was thus frowned upon, though I'm sure widely practiced nonetheless, as is the case with most things that are frowned upon. You don't bother frowning upon stuff that no one is actually doing. The peasants also ate their main meal in the middle of the day. You'd have breakfast to get you going. You'd go out and you'd toil in the fields for four or five hours, come back and eat your main meal, maybe take a nap, a siesta, which is more likely to be traditional in uh, warmer climates where the midday heat is particularly unbearable. Then you go and you toil some more until the sun goes down. You eat your supper and you go to bed. Industrialization is what pushed everybody's main meal to the end of the day. Everybody working outside the home, far away from the home, every day in the factory. Factory time is too valuable to waste on a giant meal and a nap in the middle of the day. In the industrial era, everybody works a straight shift. Maybe you get a little break or two, but you work your shift, then you go home and then you can eat. So the main meal got pushed to the evening. And to this day in the United States, there are people who refer to their evening meal as supper, not dinner. And such people are concentrated in the Southern and the Midwestern United States, two regions where the agrarian lifestyle lived on a little longer. And thus the habit of eating your dinner in the evening is a relatively new thing. Thus, some people here still call it supper. I grew up in uh, rural central Pennsylvania, where the Northeast region of the United States is blending into the Midwestern region. And I remember a distinct class divide among my friends. My little friends from like upper class families would invite me over for dinner at their house, while my friends from lower class families would invite me for supper. They met the evening meal in either case, but families who were generationally closer to the farm said supper. As industrialization pushed the big meal of the day later and later, everybody started finding that they needed something first thing in the morning. Not just children and laborers, but everybody. The 19th century is when the modern Western concept of breakfast was born. That's when health gurus started promoting breakfast to the upper classes as being a kind of virtue, something that you do because you should, even if you don't necessarily want to. Another reason that industrialization was a boon to breakfast is that it made food cheaper, and thus all kinds of indulgences previously available only to the rich became available to almost everyone. And in the Anglo-Celtic Isles, there was an ancient, big, heavy breakfast tradition among the rich that the lower classes rushed to adopt once industrialization made it affordable to them, and that is your full English or full Irish or full Scottish or whatever breakfast, which is like bacon, eggs, sausage, toast, black pudding, which is of course blood sausage, mushrooms, and my favorite part, which is of course the tomatoes, roasted or grilled or kind of fried, cut side down in the pan. My life changed when I realized tomatoes can be a breakfast item. It was when I was living in Bloomington, Indiana, and there was this really accomplished chef named Daniel Orr who came to Bloomington to kind of open up his dream place, and it's called Farm. I was eating at Farm one morning, and breakfast came with these little roasted tomatoes that were clearly inspired by the full English tradition, and they just blew my mind. The old Anglo tradition of tomatoes for breakfast survives elsewhere in the United States, too, in this uh, rather pathetic vestigial form. 
I'm talking about the tomatoes at Waffle House. Waffle House is this 24-hour breakfast food chain in the American South, and one of the side dishes you can get with your waffle or your eggs or your paper-thin breakfast steak or whatever is tomatoes, pre-sliced, cold, raw tomatoes like you would normally put on a burger. They put those on the plate with your eggs or whatever, and I always order the tomatoes at Waffle House, and I'm guessing that I'm the only one who always orders orders the tomatoes at Waffle House because the servers are always kind of shocked and confused when I order them. I get them because I get steak and eggs at Waffle House, and I like to put the slices of tomato on top of my thin little steak, and then I cut through my little stack of meat and tomatoes, and I eat them together in layers because I once heard Arnold Schwarzenegger talk about how he used to do that back in his bodybuilding days, and it sounded really good to me, so now that's what I do. Tomatoes on my steak. It's almost as good as uh, coffee with my breakfast, and I get my coffee from Trade Coffee, sponsor of this episode. I feel the same way about coffee as I feel about, like, wine, meaning I really like to try new things, but I don't really like shopping for them. The market is clouded with all kinds of crazy lingo that I don't really care to learn and pretty pictures designed to trick me into paying extra for something. What I want is a coffee sommelier, and that's what trade is for me. Trade doesn't make coffee. Trade drinks coffee. (laughs) They taste coffees from different independent coffee roasters all around the United States. They pick the best stuff that they taste from the best roasters, you know, businesses that source their beans ethically, and then Trade just picks one roaster or another to send fresh bags to my door on my schedule. I tell Trade basically what kind of coffee I like, and they curate a coffee feed for me. Except instead of being an RSS feed full of data, mine is full of delicious, interesting coffee. So if you want to support local businesses and uh, upgrade your breakfasts with better coffee, well, listen up. Right now, Trade is offering a free bag of coffee with any subscription at drinktrade.com slash Adam Show. That's drinktrade.com slash Adam Show for a free bag of coffee with any subscription purchase. Drinktrade.com slash Adam Show. If you want to support the pod in particular, as opposed to the other videos in the Adam Ragusea family of products, use Adam Show. Drinktrade.com slash Adam Show. Thank you, Trade. Anyway, the full English breakfast. While medieval and early modern aristocrats in France were pointedly eschewing breakfast as mere peasant fuel, their elite counterparts across the channel were stuffing themselves with this obscene fry-up of tomatoes and mushrooms and eggs and toast and three different kinds of meat. Why? Well, it is important to remember that the Full English is not a normal breakfast for a normal day, at least not historically speaking. It is a pre-hunt breakfast. Elites have long hunted recreationally as an expression of their social standing. It's the activity that connects them to the warrior elite that originally established their family dynasties. Hunting is an echo of war. Norman knights came over and conquered England a thousand years ago. Their new real estate holdings featured excellent hunting grounds. And these were rough men, adept in the art of killing things. And so when they lacked justification to kill Saxon peasants or to kill each other in petty power squabbles, well, they rode out and they killed game animals for fun instead. And their descendants kept up the habit. Daybreak is the ideal time to stalk deer and various other game because they're they're on the move. They're heading to wherever they're going to bed down during the heat of the day. So if your hunting party is going to go out at dawn, they'll want to fuel up their bodies in advance, hence the desire for a big, hearty breakfast. Furthermore, In the Anglo-Celtic Isles, you had a pre-Norman tradition among the Anglo-Saxons of offering guests a big breakfast as an expression of hospitality. That's a thing that the Saxons did. And when Norman aristocrats and their descendants built these big country hunting estates for themselves, they tended to kind of 
play act a rugged Anglo-Saxon lifestyle out there in the same way that like rich white people in the U.S. like to play act a rugged Native American lifestyle when they go out into the country. Think of all the summer camps with Native American themes. And so... This tradition emerged where British aristocrats would invite their friends out to their big country estates for the weekend to go shooting, as the Brits would say. And in the morning of the hunt, everybody would wake up before dawn and your servants would put out a giant hearty breakfast in the charming, rustic, rural Anglo-Saxon tradition of hospitality. Nonetheless, this breakfast still consisted of things that the servants could uh, mostly just roll out of bed and prepare quickly. Sausages and bacon are preserved meats with lots of surface area. You simply pull them out of the larder and you, you throw them on the fire and they're ready to eat in minutes. Eggs, we've already discussed. Toast, we've already discussed. It's yesterday's bread. I'm not really sure how the tomatoes and the mushrooms fit in, but, uh, you know. This whole breakfast is one big umami explosion, and tomatoes and mushrooms are the plant foods that have the most umami, even though mushrooms are not plants. Beans are plants. Beans do not cook fast, but they might have been leftover baked beans from last night at the manor house, I don't know. Or beans may simply be a modern addition to the full English breakfast that was advanced by the Heinz Company, which made canned beans, and beans on toast was a thing, so beans for breakfast. Point is, that's how rich people in the UK and Ireland came to eat a big, hearty breakfast traditionally. And when industrialization made all of that food more affordable, poor people wanted to act like rich people, and that meant eating a breakfast intended for a dawn hunting party. This stands in contrast to continental Europe, exemplified in culinary matters by France, where the traditional breakfast was and is super light. Maybe a little pastry left over from yesterday or a a little bread with some fruit preserves. Remember, preserves are the original quick convenience food. This is what most Europeans were used to, and it is what they expected as they traveled. And so hotels in Britain and America started offering so-called continental breakfast to their guests and or British and American travelers to Europe became enamored of the European style breakfast and who stays in hotels, but travelers. So hotels offered continental breakfast and continental in this context, of course, distinguishes mainland Europe from Britain and Ireland, the continent. It was a happy accident that continental breakfast is also an extremely low-cost way for hotels to add value to their guests' experience. It is so easy and cheap to just put out some pastries and some fruit and some juice on a buffet table in the lobby. Guests can simply swing down and grab what they want. There's no table service involved and little, if any, actual cooking. That's how a fancy-sounding term like continental breakfast came to describe the saddest, cheapest part of the American budget motel experience. Frozen pastries in plastic bags allowed to thaw at room temperature on the buffet and those little mini boxes of breakfast cereal. I actually love the mini boxes of breakfast cereal. I don't think they make them like this anymore, but when I was little, the mini boxes were made with perforated cardboard so that you could convert the box into a makeshift bowl. You would open up panels on the box and then you could cut open the plastic liner inside, pour in the milk, and you could have cereal in milk without a bowl. Terrible idea, but I thought it was really cool when I was a kid. That's continental breakfast in the American cultural imagination. We imagine Elite Frenchy types like Zach eat dainty little pastries for breakfast, while us rugged Americans, we need something a little more substantial. Americans, or at least white Americans, we like to think of ourselves as the original settler farmers who tamed a wild land. Australians are the same way, I think. And for whatever reason, breakfast is the meal where we like to convene with that side of our cultural heritage. Breakfast is the meal where we pretend that we're still living on the frontier, on the farm, even if we haven't actually lived on the farm for like three or four generations. 
And just look at the ads for breakfast foods. It's all farm iconography, right? Think of the rooster on the cornflakes box. That's still going on today, though it was even more intense in the 20th century. What comes to mind, my mind, is uh, the old TV and radio commercials for Jimmy Dean sausage. Jimmy Dean, not to be confused with James Dean. Jimmy Dean was a famous American singer in in the 1950s and 60s. He sang country music, an entire genre based on romantic notions of rugged agrarian way of life. In 1969, Jimmy Dean founded a company that makes breakfast sausage, and he sold his sausage with these iconic commercials where he would wax poetic in his Southern drawl about waking up on the farm and getting some good hot sausage in you before you go out to bale hay or do some other manly thing that the late 20th century American man liked to imagine himself doing instead of sitting in a cubicle all day. Sausage is a good breakfast food for all of the reasons that we've discussed, and it was particularly associated with life on the early American farm because pork is the meat of new settlements. This is something that I learned about when I was researching the video that I did on the um, historical origins of pork taboo, you know, first in Jewish society and later in Islamic society. I didn't have time to talk about this in that video, but here's another hypothesis that scholars have explored as to why ancient Israelites suddenly decided that pork is evil a few thousand years ago. It goes like this, basically, pork is the meat of transient societies, because it's relatively easy to load live pigs onto a boat and to deliver them still alive to your new colony. And once there, it's particularly easy to establish pigs. They don't need a lot of land. They don't need any special food like pasture. So you don't have to clear acres of forest for them. They'll just eat your garbage. And pigs breed prodigiously. A sow will have like, is it pronounced sow or sow? Let's go with sow. A lady pig. A sow will have a dozen piglets in a single litter. Cows are more like people, right? Like they can have twins and such, but it's rare. Cows generally have one calf at a time. So if your society is on the move, if you've picked up stakes and you're establishing a new colony somewhere, pigs are great. You can rapidly establish them as an ample food source. And indeed, there's lots of archaeological evidence of ancient Phoenicians doing just that as they sailed around the Mediterranean basin, establishing new colonies. So there's a hypothesis that pork eating would have been a thing that distinguished these new upstart Phoenician communities with more settled, established sheep and cattle herding societies, such as the ancient Israelites who first came up with the no pork rule, as far as we know. Eating meat other than pork might have been a way for them to say, oh, no, we're not those dirty boat people, the Phoenicians. Certainly pork was very popular among early Euro-American farmers trying to carve a new living for themselves out on the frontier for all of the reasons that we've just mentioned. And sausage is a particularly rugged pork product. It's what you make out of all the leftover little bits that you would probably rather not eat, but you do anyway because you're poor and out on the farm. And you make those leftover bits of the pig palatable by mixing them with spices and herbs. The classic American breakfast sausage is flavored with sage and black pepper. If you make a sausage with lots of sage in it and you try to serve it to an American for any meal other than dinner, they will look at you funny because we have come to associate that taste with breakfast as much as like maple. I also wonder if our sausage at breakfast tradition is also somewhat inherited from the Brits and their full English breakfast, the U.S., of course, being a British colony originally. But now I'm going to swing back to Zach's original question. Zach knows why people all over the world have historically eaten eggs in the morning, among other times. But what he's really wondering is like why Americans seem to have a particular attachment to eggs as a breakfast item. The French and the Italians and other Europeans have really popular egg dishes that are eaten later in the day, like quiche and frittata. In the U.S., you can slap a fried egg on a burger and call it a breakfast burger, and people will buy it for breakfast. 
We associate eggs with breakfast as strongly as we associate pork sausage flavored with sage and pepper with breakfast. That's the other thing that Burger King slaps on some form of bread and calls a breakfast item. Sage sausage equals breakfast as eggs equal breakfast. My best guess, Zach, is that it's all part of this fetishized, romanticized, national attachment that Americans have to our rugged, agrarian, frontier, relatively recent past. We like to think that the reason we're tougher than the French is that we came here and we tamed this wild land, first by killing all the people who originally lived on it, and then by scratching out a living on our homesteads with our pigs and our chickens who lay eggs. And as we industrialized, we held on to little emblems of that past that we're very proud of. And one of them is eggs in the morning. I thank you for holding on to this podcast for much longer than it really deserved. If you have something that you want me to talk about, let me know at askadamquestions at gmail.com. Ideally, ask your thing in an audio or a video file that you uh, attach to your email. Make good choices, starting with breakfast, most important meal of the day. Talk to you next time.